<laughs> so last night, uh, while I was away dancing, because I met Steve and we had this fantastic conversation, and while we were having this fantastic conversation, suddenly, St Steve, you jumped up and said, I have to go. And I felt a little alone and bereft. And this morning you were at breakfast, we were talking, and I discovered why you got up and left. Because you've been having a secret, dirty little affair for the last number of years. So will you tell me about your love affair with Philip? Yes. He went home and watched a film last night I while did. we were dancing. Um, I think a movie might be the second best feeling in the world, now that I, that I think about it. The first is a really good Mexican dinner, if you're wondering. <laughs> um, no, I, we were talking about our favorite films, and, uh, which is an awesome conversation. I have loved movies since I've loved anything, I think. And um, Austin mentioned that Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was his favorite ever. Um, that and um, Secrets and Lies, which I had forgotten I'd already seen, the Mike Lee film. So I ran back and I needed to watch Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf again to watch Elizabeth Taylor take that chicken, you know, drumstick and throw the half-eaten back in the refrigerator. Um, I've been watching between two and three films a week for the last probably at least five years. And before that, um, at least a film a week. I, I love movies. A movie's got to be really, really bad for me not to enjoy myself. Um, and even bad movies have something beautiful, wonderful, telling. They're all funhouse mirrors. You're, all, you're always seeing yourself or seeing your friends, seeing experiences in them. So that's my, that is my affair. Yeah. And, you, and you also told us that, in fact, um, you, you, you also have a way of watching movies that uh, allows you to get exercise at the same time. Yeah, yeah, no, this is, um, this is the, you know, the elliptical. You, you get to be my age. My family's got high cholesterol. Um, it's all an excuse. Like, yeah, I get to work out. But what I do is that gives me freedom to kind of Put my iPad there. It's not the big screen experience and, you know, pre-pandemic. It, it sounds like a dystopian novel, like, Daddy, tell me about the before days. Well, in the before days, son, we would go to movies and there would be crowds of people together. I really miss the theater. But I've got my elliptical and I have my iPad and there's always something ready there. And I'm not just talking movies. The, um, the quality of writing that's on streaming networks right now, it's unrivaled. In, in history right now. It's incredible. They've got time to develop these amazingly intricate stories. Um, and I feel transported every single day, which I love. And you also told me you're, you also tell your children to avoid coming down watching you. I do. Um, <laughs> because, like all, uh, all of us, when we're working out, it's a very private moment. I am barefoot, and my toes look like an old man's toes. My daughter calls them my critters. She says, put the critters away. And I work out without a shirt on. Nobody really wants to see their dad without a shirt on, and you know, unless he's Brad Pitt. And um, I've never, Brad Pitt and I have in common the fact that we're carbon based life forms. And other than that, <laughs> I think there's a lot. So, um, yeah, they, they stay upstairs willingly. I go downstairs willingly, and it works out. Well, personally, I think it's a, a parent's role to embarrass their teenage children. I think it's one of our, our duties. Yeah, especially daughters. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So um, we'll come on to the issue of film, and one of the things, because I, I, I use film a lot in teaching um, trainees, GP trainees, and one of the things I've often commented on is that you can have a group of doctors, and we can be sitting around having a case discussion about cases, and we'll discuss these cases, and we'll actually stay r relatively calm through the whole discussion. We'll go off and do our work, and you know, that, that's what's part of your work. And these can be incredibly sad cases. And then that night, we'll go to a fictional film and it will be blubbering at the end of it. And what does that say, one, about us as doctors, and what, two, what does it tell us about film as well? I think oh, that's such a neat question. Well, I think it tells us a lot about art. I'll start there first, just all art, and in this case we're talking about film, that we need, we need these cathartic experiences. That's not like a news flash to anybody. This is what people have been writing about since they've been writing about anything. I think that catharsis, if we have it with our patients, all the time. We, we heard about tears earlier today, but we did it all the time, then we're robbing them of their catharsis. I, I need them to be more important than me when I'm seeing them. But when I go see that movie, it's, it's for me. It's my experience. It's my hypnosis. I enter that film. And I, there are certain movies I remember precisely because of the emotion I felt, even yeah. more than the story. Uli's Gold, a movie about a father-son reconnection. I'm a psychiatrist. Of course I have issues with my dad. And the issue of the father-son reconnection. I'm bawling at the end of that. 
even if all day long I've heard stories about fathers and sons. I, I think we compartmentalize as, I'm not sure it's a bad thing, by the way. Like, yeah, no, because I, I often think is that, I mean, one sense, I, I, my own belief is that you need to emotionally connect because that's what makes it fun, or that's what makes right. medicine worthwhile, is that emotional connection with the patient. And, and if you don't have the emotional connection, that's compassion fatigue. Right. But you need to drop it as soon as they leave the door, because they need to go on to the next patient and right. clear the slate. So, in a way, it's not a bad thing that we can disengage. But film, I, I've always found, and if you find it when you're working with students, it does allow you fully engage with the story of a person yep. that I think can help you explore from a medical, it offers an, an, an educational opportunity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, what it does, for me at least, is it moves the, um, the very difficult topic into displacement. It moves it over here. And now you can talk about something that was really hard to talk about when you were talking about a patient. Even though you're still talking about a patient when you're talking about this film character. And I'm often been guilty of these assumptions when I'll show a film to my uh, residents, students, whatever. And I'll think they see seen it the same thing that I see. And they don't. Yeah. And I love that experience because then I learn more. I, then I get to see it through somebody else's eyes. And that's a lot like being a doctor too, right? Like that's yeah. trying to get myself into their shoes as well. I think there's no more available form of art than film um, in terms of putting on uh, the shoes of somebody else and walking in them. And I mean, take the film Secrets and Lies, which we were talking about. Blender Blethwin, who does a fantastic uh, performance. She won an Oscar for it. Um, and uh, as it is, this is a woman who, like when we discuss it as GPs, she says, the woman, if you came to you as a GP, I think, oh, you know, the anxiety. She goes on and on about things, and she's incredibly sentimental, and she's always worried about her health, and she just is so inappropriate on occasions. But when you watch the full film, you emotionally engage with her, and you can yeah. sort of a sense of empathy for this person, which I think you may replicate later on with the patient. I, I think so. It's a kind of hypnosis film. I mean, yeah. people, you know, the neuroscientists have told us that the mirror neurons probably play some role. I mean, if you think about it, it makes no sense. Something happens in a movie and you duck. I mean, it's a screen. It's a two-dimensional screen. And you still duck. You move. You react to what's up there. Um, and then you can take that experience and do it in three dimensions when you're sitting with your patients. Yeah. So you've uh, actually chosen some examples of films. And we're going to show a few examples and then discuss them. And I think we'll go with the first example now, which uh, is from The Mask. Not, not the Jim Carrey not Mask. Jim Carrey. 1985 film with the mask. Peter Bogdanovich. Peter director. Bogdanovich, that's right. And Shares in it, I think, as well. She is. She's, yeah. She won an Oscar for that's it. That's right. But, so um, we rolled the first film then. Okay. Do you need to move? Premium circumference, 67 centimeters. 67 centimeters. Baby. That's one, kid. All right. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mandible, 32.5 centimeters. Mandible, 32.5. Yeah. Well, now that's good news, Rocky. Since your last checkup in April, your jaw measurement only increased one eighth of an inch. Wow. I'm cured. <laughs> I'm healed. I can go home now. It's the water in a zoo that's built. Picture time. Surgery, That's your team better than we do. Let's oh, wait, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Oh, Rocky, you look great. I'll get my turn. You look fine, Rocky. Okay. Okay. Shoot. How's your mom, Rocky? She's great. Stand still. Oh, sorry. Turn out. I blink. <laughs> Why don't you fill me in on this, doctor? The patient was first diagnosed with craniodiaphyseal dysplasia at four years of age when it was discovered that calcium was depositing at an abnormal calcium. rate throughout his skull. Mind how calcium. And what have we learned about this disorder? It's extremely rare. One in approximately 22 million births. How was it first described? I don't. They call it lionitis. It means look of the lion. You new around here? Yes, I am. Cause? It's caused by two recessive genes and happens to the offspring of normal parents. His mother had an uneventful pregnancy, didn't ingest okay, any right. chemical substance or terodotin during gestation. That means it wasn't my mom or dad's fault. Hello, Rocky. Hey, Dr. Rudinsky. Good to see How's you again. How's it going? Our data on this patient, Dr. Rudinsky, supports your article in the New England Journal of... How are you Medicine. feeling today, Rocky? Pretty good. How are you feeling? Yeah. You still have those headaches? Yeah. They've been getting pretty bad lately. Mm. Is your mother still using the same method to yeah. make them go away? Uh, what uh, methods are those? Well, she talks to them and they go away. No medication? Nope. We're ready now, Doctor. You can All get right. dressed now, Rocky. See you later, Doc. Bye. Do you have any questions? Yeah. When are you going to invent one of these things so a guy's rear end isn't always hanging out? 
<laughs> I'd like to do the follow-up counseling with that patient's mother myself. Now, there's a great idea. Wouldn't you agree, Doctor? Oh, definitely, yes. Thank you. So, why this clip? Um, so I first saw that film when it was in the theaters. It was in 1985. It was my freshman year of college. Um, I, was, I was quite moved by it. I never forgot that particular scene. This was well before I went to medical school. I'm still not sure I want to be a doctor. I definitely wasn't sure then. Um, but I remembered that scene, and I remember thinking, here, it's Hollywood, so they're going to compress a lot into one scene. You see this dichotomized version of like one, the physician that you don't want to be, or I didn't want to be, and the physician that you can kind of admire, just the handshake and the fake toke and then the kind of walking out. Um, and I like showing that to students. I always thought, because it would be a nice example of how to kind of be uh, kind of chill or regular or normal with uh, patients who suffer um, from something that's obviously disfiguring. And I thought that this was this amazing lesson that I could teach. And what I have found, actually very recently, in talking to you about it, and also talking to my wife about it, who's a physician, uh, but also has a, a fairly significant disability, she's blind, is that um, not everybody responds to this film in the same way. Um, yeah. Which I love about it, actually. And uh, because I, I do it too, and I saw the, t the two doctors, and I always say, I said, you know, obviously one's the biomedical doctor, which, oh, and, and I think that's the asshole that they were talking right. about earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then you've got the, the doctor, as you say, that could inspire you want to be like. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and in a sense, I thought, oh God, you know, is it a bit over stylized? But I know myself, when I was a kid in hospital, I remember a doctor with a medical student at the end of my bed, I was only nine years old, and he was talking into a tape, and he was saying that he thought because of my disfigurement, he thought that I would probably want to have uh, amputations later on in life. And I'm sitting there listening to this, and he just had this conversation with the tape recorder, and it does happen a lot that, you know, often you see doctors discuss patients in the uh, third person, even. In the third person, yeah. right in front of them. Right. Yeah. So it does happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think um, if you tell medical students it happens, they don't believe you. Um, if you show it in the film, they might, I, my hope at least is in showing the film, like, is to, is to sort of give them exactly an example of what not to do, to, to not do that sort of third person talk. Or sometimes I'll do that when I'm talking to parents who are in the room and I'll say, look, I'm sorry to talk about you billing a third person. I'm, I know you're right there, but I'm gonna talk to your parents. And, and then they sort of laugh about it. Yeah. But you had a different reaction to it I was also. gonna say, yeah, because we were, we're going to talk later on about using film as prescription, which I actually had never even thought of. It was a brilliant idea and we'll come to that. But uh, I was thinking about it because in a sense, we were discussing the fact that, oh, you know, what happens if they don't like the film? And I was looking at this, and being honest, I didn't like this film. And uh, the reason is, this actually is to do with disfigurement. And I understand the concept, because when I was a teenager, uh, I mean, I couldn't look in mirrors, because I know I look weird. As my mother always said to me, you have a great personality, which I, I always interpreted as, you look like shit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I used to be, I, 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 interestingly, I never dreamt, of, when I looked in the mirror, I suddenly remember how I looked. I used to conceive myself as, as the, but it was interesting, I was watching this, and I thought, oh, he's too relentlessly positive about this disfigurement. That, that was annoying me. Mm -hmm. And uh, but what, even though it was annoying me and I didn't like it, I engaged with the issue of the disfigurement, and it brought me back to my own idea of disfigurement. So I remember thinking, if I had watched that film and I'd go into you as a doctor, I'd be actually ready to talk about this as an issue. That's, that's my goal. You know, yeah. um, look, the, in psychiatry, at least, this is, I guess, my personal opinion, We've way overpromised with the medicines. They're okay. Um, they do some good. Uh, but what the, where the money is, metaphorically, it's the connection, the talking. And yes. so if you came in having watched that film and you said, I didn't like that film, yeah. we're off to the races. That's a good thing. Yeah. We got something to talk about right now. And my only risk there is making sure I don't take over the conversation. I don't try to convince you that it's a good movie. That would not be fair. That's not my job at this point, is to understand why you didn't like it, what you didn't like about it. And for both of us at some unconscious or metaphoric level to understand that you're also talking about yourself, yeah. that you're not talking about Rocky in this movie. You're talking about you. Exactly. And um, it's interesting because I was reflected on this movie after seeing it. And in fact, it brings me back to a, a connection to the arts because when I was in hospital and uh, I, I, I had this, 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 this problem with my legs and the disfigurement, 
I used to actually have, there's no TV in hospital, so I used to have to read. So I read The Lord of the Rings nine times, and The Hobbit six times, and fantasy books five. So in, in, interestingly, I conceived of myself in a funny way as like a wizard. And because that's what I thought was a wizard. And then I, in re thinking back on it, I think it was like a wizard has power, and I had felt powerless. So in this fantasy of being a wizard, I was in a way able to escape this, this sense of powerlessness I was feeling. See, that, that's just gold. That, yeah. that revelation, if that came from this movie, that's all I could ever ask. I, I would ask for one more thing, which is for you to stand up and say, you shall not pass with the, <laughs> with the thing. Um, the yes. Balrog has come, but you're not going to do that. Um, uh, that's what I want, yeah. you know? What a great story. That yeah. story then gives us something that we have in common, and we can refer back to that through the course of our getting to know each other, whether you're my friend or my patient, which Thanks. some in my younger days, I may have worried about that boundary, but I don't worry so much about it. And just a little thing is that, uh, I mean, I also went to the, when I write to the end of it, in a sense, people often ask me, well, did I become a doctor because I spent so much time in hospital? And in fact, I'm thinking of this, I think more I became a doctor because in a way, the fantasy of being a magician is sort of like a doctor, like, you know, I know we heard all the dark magic that doctors practice today, but we also do a bit of good magic. And yeah. you know, there's a bit of element of that, and maybe that's part of my fantasy got me to becoming a doctor. No, I mean, geez, every... There was an interesting paper on, um, as I say, every medical movie, but there's an interesting paper, it's actually in the book that I wrote, I, I reference it, looking at the way doctors were perceived in movies, mostly in American movies, from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and there was this, you might expect, a general graph that went from incredibly trusted, almost godlike, like anything they say would go, in, you know, like chiseled chin, handsome, um, all men, of course. Um, and then around the 80s, it started to go the other direction. This, that very arrogance, which was celebrated in those movies in the 50s, became this thing that was derided in the, the younger physician in this yes. scene that yeah. we just saw. Yeah. Um, so, so you, you know, it, it, the way we are perceived culturally in film is super, super important, and also another whole area of inquiry about which you know, entire books have been written. And in fact, it brings us back to another comment was someone said in the audience, you know, those doctors we hate, lots of patients love them, because sometimes that sense, in a way, that's, it'd be interesting to explore why do they love that sort of authoritative type figure. Oh, it's, yeah, and I also have to say about that talk, those doctors we hate, I, I really wanted to ask a question just to say the word asshole at a conference. I, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, just, yeah. It felt so liberating, so I was Absolutely. glad you brought it up. Thank you. So um, I think we might go on to the next uh, um, clip film, which is from a, a good old film, uh, Fatal Attraction. Yeah, 1985. It's a hard film, a little trigger warning. And we, we'll duck down again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or do you want us to move to the... Can you all... Side. Can you see you okay? Okay. So what can I get you? I've got scotch, I've got vodka, I just I should be in the... Cut this shit, will you? Just cut it! I don't know what you're up to, but I'm going to tell you it's going to stop right now. No, it's not going to stop. It's going to go on and on until you face up to your responsibilities. What responsibilities? I'm pregnant. I'm going to have our child. Alex, that's your choice, honey. That has nothing to do with me. I just want to be a part of your life. Oh, this is the way you do it, huh? Showing up at my apartment? Well, what am I supposed to do? You won't answer my calls. You change your number. I'm, I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. You don't get it. You just, you don't get it. But you remember our weekend? Wasn't that wonderful? Why can't we just be like that again? I know you feel it too. I mean, what are you so afraid of? Hey, 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 just don't flatter yourself, Alex. Go ahead, hit me. If you can't fuck me, why don't you just hit me? You're so sad. You know that, Alex, lonely and very sad. Don't you ever pity me, I'll pity you. bastard. I'll pity you. I'll pity you because you're sick. Why? Because I won't allow you to treat me like some slut you can just bang a couple of times and throw in the garbage? I'm going to be the mother of your child. I want a little respect. You want respect? What are you doing? Please, Dan. Please don't go. I didn't mean it. Please, I'm sorry. I'll tell your wife. You tell my wife. I'll kill you. It only takes a phone call! So 
So, now, why this film? <laughs> um, that movie, which is now clearly dated for all sorts of reasons, uh, I mean, we could make a whole, you know, alphabetized list, but that was the go-to movie when I was in medical school, and it remains the go-to movie in an awful lot of teaching to talk about borderline personality disorder. A, a, fra a term, a set of diagnoses that I have a hard time with by itself, but that's the example you're gonna use? That's the example? Uh, not everybody who seems to use these particular defense mechanisms is nearly that, um, I, it's a terrible thing to say, but off-putting, scary, frightening, um, ready to um, attack. Also, the guy in the movie who's supposed to be like the victim here, he's pretty awful. Michael Douglas, he, he's a pretty awful guy in this movie. He has an affair, he's not taking any responsibility, he slams her up against the wall. How could we show this movie to medical students? And yet it was shown to me at my medical school, the very medical school I'm teaching at right now. They put that up there, George Valiant put that up there and said, hey, this is what borderline personality disorder looks like. So I show that sometimes to say, this is not what it looks like. And in case, because if you Google borderline personality disorder film, this is what you'll get. That'll be off, almost always the first hit. Well, I'm glad you hated it because I was thinking, bloody hell, I didn't like the first one, and I definitely don't like the second one. <laughs> and I thought, because exactly as you say, it's sexist. Uh, I actually thought well, I was on Glenn Close's side. This bastard won't take responsibility for the kid. Yeah. And yeah, and then he slams her up. You know, there's violence, there's, there's men, and it's interesting it was accepted back then. Yeah. Uh, as in, you know, and, uh, and so on all those fronts, um, and he calls her slut. So, like, it's just it's so sexist and, and gendered as well. So I think, oh, how am I going to face this? So I'm delighted you hate it too. And then the other issue is I personally hate the term personality disorder as well. Um, and in fact, they say it, the term is a very sexist term. They're like a, a lot of feminists have come out against the term yep. borderline personality disorder. It tends to be applied to females. I think one feminist says it's just a, a, a medical pseudonym for a difficult, angry woman. It's, yes. It is such a problematic... I, I mean, on the one hand, it's a very problematic concept, and we could have a whole different talk about this. On the one hand, there are folks who have, who have relatively maladaptive ways of, of responding to the challenges of the world. But to say that the self is disordered is a, is a really kind of fascinatingly arrogant thing for us to do. Um, now, when I tell my students, you want to pass your boards, you've got to be able to answer what are the criteria for borderline personality disorder. Learn it, but then unlearn it pretty quickly and figure out who this person is. And, and you know, what matters to them. With regard to the, the, you know, the, the violence and the sexism, one of the hard things for me about movies is I go back and I watch movies that I remember quite fondly. This one I don't remember fondly. Mm. But I recently rewatched 16 Candles, a, a movie that I just adored growing up, um, one of the John Hughes films. It's got some horrifically racist, horrifically, say, as a day rape scene. And what was fascinating to me is I saw it when I was 14, 15. I didn't remember any of that. It didn't even hit me. It didn't even strike me as something that shouldn't be in a movie, especially, you know, not one that kids would see, and especially in a comedy. So we also have to be able to see these films through the, you know, through the lens of the time in which they were made, and then we have a hard decision to make, which is whether we'll still accept them. And then I, I, I use 12 Angry Men all the time as a film. And I don't know if anyone's seen 12 Angry Men, a great film from the 1930s. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. And it's all about how Henry Fonda persuades a whole jury to his side. And uh, the reason I use it, it was another doctor taught me how to use it the, cause to teach the art of persuasion, because we as doctors are constantly trying to persuade yeah. people to do things, and there's many different ways to persuade, which Henry Fonda. But if you look at that film, all male, all white jury, because in the 30s, that's what you had. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they're trying to black man, too. That's right, the they're movie. trying to black man. Yeah, yeah so no, I mean, it couldn't, uh, you think we've come somewhere since, like, look at George Floyd last year, and then we had that movie from, what, 40 years, 50, 60 years before. Uh, it's uh, the guy who optioned my first uh, novels, George Romero, the guy who made Night Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead and all that. Twelve Angry Men was one of his very favorite films, and he used to talk to me about it all the time, about, again, the, the sort of art of persuasion, the way um, the whole movie is staged, the way there's never one person moving without somebody else moving. Somebody stands up, somebody sits down. I, I love, because I think about that in terms of the examining room, too. Yes. where you should be in the room, whether you should be lower or higher. Henry Fonda always makes himself a little bit lower. Unless he needs to make his point, then he stands up. He was a big, tall yeah. man, so he could stand up and sort of lean over them. So the use of physical space, which we yeah. as doctors, because sometimes we're standing over patients, somewhere right. sitting by. I, I, it's interesting, because I do a lot of work with homeless people, and I find, I, I, I find the actual best way if you go on the streets to talk to a homeless person is actually sit beside them. Don't go down in your hunkers. 
Because if in your hunkers you're still above them, but the best way to engage with them is to sit actually on the street beside. And because I always sat because of my disability, I learned that the street was natural to me. So it's, that's a really interesting of the, I hadn't realized that myself. You know. it's, it's one of my very favorites. And one of the things I was saying to you I learned from that film was brilliant was uh, the, um, there's one character, do you know the baseball man, the one who wants to go to the baseball yeah, game? Yeah, that's all he wants. All he wants. He's got uh, tickets, finally. Yeah. yeah, so he votes guilty because everyone's voting guilty except Henry Fonda. And then as soon as he realizes that the vote is switching, he says, not guilty. <laughs> right. And the old man stands up and says, you can't do that. You can't just decide because you want to go to a baseball game. And Henry Fonda turns to him and says, there are some people there's no point wasting energy on. And I have learned so much from that because, you know, you, there's, there's some people who get up and stridently argue. There's no point engaging with them. So if they're in an audience, what I do now is they see up, make their point and say, thank you. Anyone else? Yep. Don't argue with them. Just keep avoiding Trying them. to get the residents to not convince a patient yeah. who doesn't want to be convinced, it's exactly that moment. I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a film I'm going to use now and, and hadn't used in the past. Brilliant film. And uh, then just on the other one of the personalities, sorry, we go off, because uh, I, I, I myself, as I said, I, I'm really interested, and I, I wrote this article. I'm, I'm very proud to have, I think, the only medical journal article with the word fuck in it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, in the title, it's called the, the Triple Fuck Syndrome. And it's where I say that because, you know, um, I say the first fuck is you're born into poverty, and then the second fuck is we blame you for being poor, as our own Tisha Leo Radker said, he represents those who get up early in the morning, and then, you know, obviously pe poor people don't. And um, also we blame them for the effects of, of the poverty, such as a drug addiction and, and violence. And then the third fuck is we as doctors call them personality disorder, right. when poverty is the biggest associate with yeah. and trauma. Yeah, yeah. So. So, so this discussion, that all came from watching that pretty unsavory clip Absolutely. we just watched. That's the benefit of it. Like, to me, it jump starts these conversations that if you just jump into them with the med students, first of all, you don't have their attention, but also um, you have it, you got to give somebody something to disagree about, or at least to, um, to have a disagreement about. And that then leads to these really cool talks about, like, well, what do we make of the fact that we've decided to say that someone's personality is disorder. What do we make of the fact that most folks with personality disorders have this history of poverty that you're talking about? Maybe yeah. it's not like, maybe it's not a disorder at all, or maybe it's a societal disorder. Yeah. And if there was two people who were to nominate for personality disorder, they sort of are on two sides of the Atlantic, uh, one to the west of us and one to the east of right. us. <laughs> Jeez. Um, I'm uh, moving here. If that I know. <laughs> if he gets back in. So um, we go on to the next um, film then, and this is a film I had never seen before, and I watched the film, and I, lo I actually love this film, so I did. So um, this film's called Welcome to Me, so we'll show the next clip on this one. All right, leave the almonds on the floor. I can clean them up after the session. Would it make you feel better if you were eating too? This eating is not working for me. No, the food is distracting from the work. I have to eat because of my new relationship with glucose. All right, you can have a snack at five of two and another one at 2.50. Please stop eating in session. So, like Oprah, but with a swan boat. Talk show. Mm-hmm. Hosted by? Me. Hosted by you. All right, well, how about a little recap? Um, in case you missed last week's episode of the Alice Klieg Show, That's here's what's what going on. It's not the name of it. You're off your meds. You just spent $15 million. You're living in a reservation casino, and you're hosting your own talk show. I thought I asked you not to eat. It's a banana. It's in its own container. <laughs> Why this clip? <laughs> um, I'm just curious, how many folks have seen Welcome to Me in the audience? Anybody seen it? No. Oh, it's, so, it's such a great film and it got overlooked. I, I love the film. So um, it was, I always show this after I would show the Glenn Close film, The Fatal Attraction, because this is a film that was openly, statedly about somebody with borderline personality disorder. The, the conceit of the film, I'm not giving anything away here, this is a woman with um, all sorts of issues for which she sees uh, Tim Robbins, who plays her psychiatrist, and she wins the California lottery. She wins $85 million. 
and she decides what she's going to do with that is have her own talk show called Welcome to Me. And it's going to be all about her. And it's going to be two hours every single day. And of course, she does it. And it's, of course, as you might expect, a surprise hit. Um, and in it, she brings on people from her life and kind of has it out with them. Um, and she is stated to have borderline personality disorder. This is what Robbins will say. This is what she says. She actually says it on the show. She says, first they call it bipolar, then they call it rapid cycling, then they call it borderline personality disorder. Who knows what I have? And, but she does it in a very stilted way because she's trying to actually play a, a part. She's like, doesn't know who she is, doesn't know what her identity is. To me, if you're going to depict some of the challenges of this thing that we've decided to call, we in the medical establishment, borderline personality disorder, this film is so much more gracious, builds so much more empathy, and is so much more honest, I feel like, than the Glenn Close film does. And it allows greater connection, greater empathy. One thing I can't stand is when the residents come to me and say, this next patient is such a borderline. Um, mm. Let's go see. And I'm like, no, no, this next patient is Sally, who grew up here, and, da -da 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 -da. and maybe there are some things that are bugging you about her, but let's sit down and figure out what that is. This movie, I hope, sort of takes away from that. Absolutely, and I, like, she, she's right on the spectrum of humanity in a sense. And uh, it's interesting because I, 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 I found yeah, you can engage empathically with a very strange personality. You know, you're not your normal personality. Someone who you meet, as I said, um, on the outer spectrum of the range of humanity. But what I took out of the film, interesting, was which was another discussion point, was this te this doctor who she has this relationship. He's a very good relationship with. Yeah. Him. But she does something on the show which causes huge offence to him, and he ends the relationship. Yep. And it's really interesting because one of the discussions I always think would be worth having in this if I had students is, you know, should he have ended the relationship? Yeah, she done broken his trust, but is it not our role as a doctor to stick with, like, she's someone who will find it hard to get a doctor. Yeah. So is it not our role to stick through people who cause offense and hang, with, hang in with them? It's, that's, that question, which if I ask that question when, it, when we have time to watch mm. the whole movie, and it's amazing the responses you get. Almost every medical student says you should stick with it. And then if I do it in postgraduate courses, probably about half the physicians in the room will say, no, we're done. Like that kind of loss of trust, that's a violation of the patient-doctor contract, we're done. They have all sorts of, they'll sort of start quoting John Locke, there's a social contract, all that. I actually think it's up for, you know, it, it's not, it, it's up for grabs. I think I would have stuck with her, and I don't think that's just me being arrogant, I, I think, um, or sort of superpower. I'm curious where the story's going. And so, so there's a kind of selfishness to my sticking with it, what actually might be to her detriment. That's what my colleagues have argued. Like, actually, she needs somebody to say, no, you, you went too far, therefore this, this door is closed. You gotta go find somebody else. This is too good a story. So I wanna know what's gonna happen. And I think that's often what drives me a little bit. And as long as I don't have that be the only thing that's driving me, I think I can live with it. But well, I have to live with it, because it's what I am. Um, but the students, the residents, other physicians still have different opinions. I mean, would you? I'm just curious. Would you keep seeing her? Or would you? I, I see. I, I, I like sticking with patients. And um, Mirich was talking this morning about a patient who went out and told me, you know, no point waiting for that fucking doctor. <laughs> um, I once had a patient who walked out of my waiting room. Uh, who they'd been looking for some medication off, and I'd refused. And they went out and said, he's one small little fucking bastard of a cunt. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> in front of the whole waiting room. So, Mirich, I think I trump you. Um, and uh, so I opened the door and I said, I am not little. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and what was great was, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then my, 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 uh, the guy who works for me outside, he said, yeah, but he is a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what was great was that banter allowed us to maintain the relationship. So, uh, because my feeling is though they're the people who are probably going to be the ones most likely to not get care, and they're the ones who are likely to end up most likely dying young. Yep. And, with and, yeah. and then, in addition to that, that banter's fun. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard work, but it's fun. It's, it's like a kind of improv. And Absolutely. as long as it's not only about you, I think yeah. it's okay. Like, I think it's what keeps us fresh. Absolutely, medicine's great crack. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, are you seriously telling us to prescribe... Um, to our patients films, you do this. Yeah, yeah, so I got, I wish this were my idea, Mike Jelinek was one of my mentors, he was um, the head of child psychiatry at Mass General where I trained and then ended up kind of putting on nicer suits and becoming an administrator, but he would give people prescriptions for movies. 
he would say, look, our, our meds, they work okay, but if I can get you something to talk about, um, that's, that's golden for me. So I'll sometimes see a patient, and it's, it's almost kind of a free association where, where like, and I'm sure we all do this, uh, a movie comes to my mind, and I say, hey, have you seen blah, blah? And now, you know, we all have computers in our room, so I can pull up a scene from it. This was back when we saw people in person and not over Zoom in the before days, as we talked about. But someday, we'll have them back in the office again. Or I'll write it down, and I'll say, go watch this, and we'll come back next week. Let's, let's talk about this. I was trying to think of one I did that recently with. There's the... Um, amazing, how many people have seen High Fidelity with John Cusack? And yeah. It's the amazing proposal scene in that, where he basically goes from being a teenager to an adult, where he says, I'm tired of the fantasy. Fantasy's not real. I, I want you with all your imperfections. And it's actually an a amazingly romantic scene. And, and she laughs when he proposes. She's like, this is your proposal? I love that scene. And when I'm working with, say, 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds, who are sort of stunned that Love isn't what they thought it was. It's not like a, you know, early, I don't know, rom-com. That's a great scene for them to go and watch. Um, that's, that's a scene I like. 500 Days of Summer is another one I'll have them watch, uh, where you sort of realize that it's, it's more raw than that. Because I remember there was a fantastic um, facility up where someone introduced this uh, library, a medical library, where they actually put books in our local library, and that you could then prescribe them a book, and they'd go up to the library and the actual library of so. That's now I've got this ability now to prescribe film, I think. Just any art. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, go watch this play if you can. Go watch this video on YouTube. I mean, yes. this gift of the internet. There's a lot of problems with the internet, but there's a lot of gifts, too. You yeah. Can access stuff right away. Um, my son sent me a video yesterday uh, because I'm always saying, you don't wash up. And he says, you don't see me when I wash up. He says, you know, you miss it. And uh, I say, I don't miss it. You just don't do it. And he sent me a video yesterday, which was a, a, a man saying how often our perception lets us down and we think we're the only one who does everything. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, watch and learn. <laughs> there's, a, um, there's, a, there's an old video online that I, that I go to all the time, which is not quite a movie, but, it, but it's because it was real. I remember I was on my OBGYN rotation and we were in the um, residence room and we were watching Sports Center on ESPN and there was the interviewer was interviewing Jim Everett, who was an American football quarterback. Wasn't very good, and it was a very sexist moment. The uh, interviewer would call him Chris Everett and sort of poke fun at him in two ways. One is that Chris Everett's a woman, and two is that Chris Everett was a much better tennis player than Jim Everett ever would be. And this was in live, this was live. And so Everett says, hey, if you say this one more time, you're gonna regret it. And the interviewer says, well, we got, we got five minutes left. Um, we're gonna make a full segment out of this. I think I'll say it again. And Everett says, I don't think you will. And this is all live. And of course, we're all leaning forward. This is actually what politics has become. But back then, it was just like a sports thing. Uh, and he says, Chris. And Everett knocks the table over and punches, you know, just punches him, knocks him, tackles him. And I'll show this to kids who get in fights at, at school. And the reason I show it is, it strikes me that it's the stupidest fight in the universe. Like, it would have been so much cooler. Not that there's, well, there probably are some smart fights, but the stupid fights, like, so much cooler if Everett had gotten up and just said, I don't need this shit, and yeah. just like walked off the stage. It would have been cooler if, if um, Will Smith had done that, you know, like, like um, mm. rather than the punch. Everett was five times this guy's size. It's pretty obvious he's going to win this fight. There was nothing to prove here. So I'll show them that scene. Like, maybe the next time somebody pushes you around, just say, I don't need this, and just really? walk out of the lunchroom. It was like Will Smith going up to protect his wife's name up yes. on stage at the Oscars. And he, there were a lot of ways he could have done it. Yeah. Didn't have to hit her. He, he could have yeah. just said, Chris, enough. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. This sucks. Exactly. Stop it. So um, we go on to our last scene. This film I really loved. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm growing more and more in love with the choices you make. <laughs> so um, this film, uh, and it's, it's just to clarify, we'll come back to this issue before we get onto it. Yeah, because uh, I'm not a fan of horror, so that, oh, I'm not going to like this movie. You lo love horror. I you? love horror films. Um, always have written about them, did a TED talk on them. I, I think they're fantastic. Hi. Um, I think they are the, the best fun house mirror we have for movies. I think we see distorted versions of ourselves in horror films. We see all these examples of what not to do. Um, I, uh, I feel like if we really looked at ourselves, kind of warts and all, it's really, really challenging. But if we can watch a horror film, and we can see ourselves in those horror films. 
I feel like we learn something about ourselves, but, but it's in this campy displacement, and it's much, much easier to tolerate. And then from a psychiatric standpoint, the movie we're going to, this is a scene from The Babadook, which is a fantastic horror film, which is also about motherhood. Uh, I love the movies where you don't know whether the thing is real or not. You never see the monster except through the eyes of the protagonist. It's essentially an unreliable narrator. And that to me feels a lot like psychiatry. Like who am I to say they're not hearing a voice? Of, of course they're hearing a voice. When I say well, the voices aren't real, that's not very empathic. And these movies feel the same way to me. Like in these movies, you never know whether this monster is real or not, except to the person experiencing it. And that's, after all, who matters the most in the movie. Uh, we'll adopt our prayer to Mecca pose again, and we'll go ahead with the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll go ahead with the last scene. You movie. see, buy it now. <laughs> yeah. Why this, Fickler? Um, first of all, it's just a terrific film by itself. It's a, it's a film that's celebrated not just among uh, fans of horror, but just all film lovers. Uh, or Most film critics really adored this movie when it came out. It was the beginning of a bunch of horror films that had been directed by women, which is um, new in the industry and, and well overdue and, and, you know, as the director of this movie pointed out, women feel fear too. Why can't they make these movies? And in this movie, this movie is about rather than pushing your fears and your trauma away, facing your trauma head on. It doesn't do much good to box it off. She, she has suffered a terrible trauma, and after this trauma, she finds this book on her shelf, which is the story of the Babadook, and she reads it to her son, who is a very difficult boy to raise, who's at this point around four or five years old. And then she keeps getting rid of the book, and of course the next day it's always on the shelf. Um, so this is the first moment where the monster itself shows up. And if there ever were a metaphor for you can't just throw the trauma, the traumatic experience out in the trash. You, you don't, it's just our brains don't work that way. You can't just shove it off to the side. You've got to actually um, go through it. And in fact, that's what we use art for. You don't know in this whole movie whether that thing is ever real. It's never there when she's not there. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't make it any less frightening or any less real to her. And so when my residents will say, well, the psychosis, you know, the visions aren't real. The voices aren't real. I'm like, of course they're real. Like, I mean, the person just told you they're real. They are by definition real. Then they just told you that. Well, they might be making it up. They're still real. Like, it's still there. So why don't you, what do you have to gain by challenging them on that? Why don't you go with them? 
on this journey. And that, to me, feels a lot like a horror film, too. Oh, yeah, because I, I love the film, because, I mean, it, it's a little bit of a spoiler, but at the end of the film, she doesn't get rid of the monster. She actually manages it. Right, it's resiliency. And it's, yeah, and yeah. that's sort of like the inner darkness, because this often thing about healing, I think this idea of healing is that we make it go away. We, this concept of cure versus yep. healing. Or, or, cure or like, is, it's gone. Yeah, it makes me crazy. Right, yeah. like, she, resiliency is not, I mean, we all know this, we're preaching to each other's choir yeah. here. Resilience is not making the thing go away. Resilience yeah. is learning to live with the thing, like, yes. like to cope with it. And she, she learns, she doesn't make it go away. In fact, the only way she can deal with it is by learning to be with it uh, and accepting it and having it kind of come to a stumbling exception of her. And this would be a wonderful film to teach medical students. I'm actually going to go and use it. So I am, yeah. You know, I, I taught an um, uh, undergraduate course on horror films at um, Harvard, and at the end of every term, I would get the university to pay for, we would, our rule was we're going to go see one movie in the theaters, and whatever movie happens to be playing, we're going to go see it, and the Babadook was playing. So that was the first place I saw it with a bunch of undergraduates who were begging me to buy them beer, and in the States, if you're not 21, you can't buy them beer, so I really couldn't do that. But it reminded me of something, because I, I heard people in here laugh. One of the reasons I really miss the theater is horror films. They are, they're fun watching by yourself or with your family, but in a group of people that you've only just gotten to know, or even of people that you don't know at all, it's absolutely delightful. It's like, talk about building community in, in almost no time. It's like getting on a roller coaster together. Suddenly, everybody on the roller coaster are best friends, because they made it through it. Uh, one of my most delightful movie experiences. Did we see The Conjuring? It's really, really scary. Fascinating to me. It's a satanic possession movie. I'm Jewish. There's no Satan. I got nothing to worry mm. about. And, and mm. yet, they always terrify me. They ter America is a largely agnostic nation, and yet, notwithstanding all the nonsense of late. But nevertheless, these satanic possession movies always get us. I went to see this film in an uh, area of um, Boston that was, um, there were a lot of uh, housing developments nearby. Uh, there were a lot of uh, poor folks there. They were super loud. And because there's a scene where he finds like a tunnel and it's set in the 70s. They had flashlights, but of course he lights a match instead of a flashlight to go down there because the filmmaker just couldn't resist this moment. And he goes down there and, and the kid behind me is like, what are you doing? Don't go down there. What? <laughs> and, and after the movie, the kid apologized to me. I was like, no, man, you made the film. Yeah. Like, this is, this is, it's like going to a ball game. You're all yeah. part of the experience. Well, it's like, I mean, I, I said I don't watch horror films, but I remember I watched The Woman in Black with my family, which is a great cla yeah. classic ghost story with scares. And uh, my daughter's not the most tactile person. And next thing I find her clutching my hand. So I've shown a few other horror films to her since, because it's a great way of getting contact with my daughter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But I also, it's interesting, I only realized this when I was watching that clip there, actually, that actually the way sometimes we use horror is there's, there's the idea of, of surprise, of the scare. You know, the, but there's also anticipation is another form of, of yep. thing. And it struck me that a lot of patients we face come in anticipating bad news. Yep. So, in fact, this is probably something that we see in our daily lives with doctors. Yeah, and, and they do something in this film that's exactly in keeping with that, which happens a lot in horror films especially, where they they give you a kind of false moment of anticipation. There's that moment where you think something's there and then it's the dog. Yes. Um, and this happens with patients all the time. Please sit down, I, I need to tell you something. What is it? Well, your shoe's untied. Yeah. That's not the thing that they're worried that they're gonna hear. But then the next thing you say might be the thing that they're worried they're gonna hear. But yeah. think of that constant state. We heard about cortisol earlier. Think of that constant state of cortisol. A really good horror film will never let that cortisol basal rate come down. We'll always kind of keep it up and then it'll go boom and then it'll come back and then boom and then it'll up. And then when you come out, interestingly, uh, the studies of folks who like horror films, I could go on forever about this, are um, they come out feeling energized, more alive, more kind of ready to uh, enjoy the evening. And when you ask them what they liked about it, it isn't what scared them, it's trying to understand why they were scared of what they were scared. It's a metacognitive action. It's like, that frightened me, why did it frighten me? And that to me feels like an awful lot like a patient's experience when they come in. And I was going to go on and talk, because you talk about it in your book, which is well worth getting. It's out there, and the thing, I actually have a copy. I meant to bring it up with me. It's a beautiful orange book, so go out and get it, called Film. Um, and you talk about the use of film as community, and I know I'm in a film club with other medics. So I was going to ask about the idea of film clubs. But actually, I think we should let the audience, we've only a few minutes left, so just in case there's any questions in the audience. Sure. Um, has anyone any questions, if you could stand up? 
it's hard to is see. Is there a question down there? I can't tell. There, yeah, someone over here, in the middle over here. Oh, sorry, yeah. Oh, it, uh, no, no, not at all. Um, it's called movie clips, actually. Um, so, uh, it's it's uh, so, and this is actually interesting from a teaching standpoint. The fair use laws, at least in the United States, and and I understand they apply as well um, here in Ireland, allow you to use YouTube clips um, for teaching, and you don't always find the clip you're you're looking for, but you often do. Um, and you don't have to use that. You can use anything that hap finds its way onto YouTube. You can't use other sites, um, per se, like you can't rip a DVD and use it unless you ask permission of it, because that's what I'm told. No one's going to come after us. We're really yeah. small potatoes in that, in that way. Um, but Movie Clips is a great site. Sure. And there's another question down here. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate what you're talking about and how relatable, especially in younger generations where they're using TikTok videos and media is just enormous to them for relatability. But I was also kind of thinking and connecting the dots of um, the tear bank, how sometimes patients do have a really hard time and even myself sometimes have had a hard time connecting to your sadness and not allowing yourself to cry. But also, my sister and I have a favorite set of movies that we'll watch if we feel like yeah. we need that catharsis of the releasing yeah. of that emotion. And those are like guaranteed to be tear jerkers. And it just kind of interests me that in my patient care that I could advocate for them to yeah. watch a movie that they think is a tear jerker to them to help them to touch into their own emotions about whatever sadness or grief or process that they're going through that helps them to understand their own state of mind in that situation. And have you experienced that with your patients? Brilliant point. Brilliant yeah, point. yeah. Um, first of all, I don't know where you are. I'm staring there smiling as if you might be right over there. Okay, there you are. I, I actually feel fondly about all of you too, but she's the person I was talking to. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I have to ask you, uh, what are the movies that, like, give me one of them, the, the, a go-to film, if it's not too personal, that you and your sister watch? Oh. Uh. <laughs> It's perfect. No, no. Um, uh, for me, uh, Terms of Endearment gets me every time. The Squid and the Whale, I'm, I'm a mess at the end of. But you feel better at the end yeah. of it, too. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, my one is, when I, when I was depressed, I used to always uh, sink into it and buy a, a tub of Hagen dazs and watch Shadowlands. Uh, oh, highly recommend What a great film, <laughs> too. Oh, my yeah. God. And the tub of Hagen dazs is very important, too, so yeah. I shouldn't be giving advertising. Steve, we actually have gone over time. I... Uh, I have to say, we could keep talking. It's been absolutely wonderful to talk to it's you. Been and a really, for everyone, Steve Schlock. Steve Schlock. Thank you. Austin Carroll. Thank you. Thank you.